Hello, and welcome to Ag Tech Talk, Agribusiness Global's podcast exploring the latest technological innovations, tools, and services that are moving the crop input community forward. In each episode, we'll talk with industry experts for their insights on ag tech solutions being developed around the world and how they could impact your business. Whether it's agricultural technology you'll find in the field, on a tablet, or in the air, we'll talk about it here. Today, we're talking with Rob Tippett, a leading voice in the Internet of Things and Digital Twins. He's an advisor, speaker, author, podcast host, inventor, and a veteran. We're speaking with Rob about the Internet of Things and Digital Twins. Find out what those are all about. So, Rob, welcome to the show, and let's get started. Uh, welcome to the podcast, uh, Rob. Um, let's start with um, maybe just a general definition of Internet of Things and digital twins. Are, are, are They're not the same thing. Can you explain what they are? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, you know, the Internet of Things has been around for a long time, and it's, you know, taking, you know, sensing things out in the real world. It's, you know, taking the, the natural world around us and turning it into digital signals. Objects and things are in the world. Um, you know, in the past, the boys, you know, people can go discover things with their eyes and ears and senses and things like that. Um, and we've had the internet for a long time and we kind of had the internet of people, um, and people entering information about what's going on, like out on the farm, or what's going on with a, in a factory or things like that. And the internet of things is now the things can talk to us over the internet and or privately. And so through a number of all the, you know, I'd say the smartphone revolution has really helped us because it drove down the cost of the different components you need to facilitate this internet of things, all the low cost sensors, you know, uh, wireless connectivity, cellular networks getting pervasive and ubiquitous, um, things like that. So now we can, we can know what the world. And so instead of people always having to go somewhere to find out what's going on, you know, in my factory with my car on, on my farm, what's the moisture like now they can just know in real time, uh, auto- automatically. Right. Um, digital twins think of those as the things that you're monitoring basically um you know you can have a digital twin of a car or a truck or a collection of things like an apple orchard and so that's actually the thing and so you know you know how like when you have different technology revolutions and it's all exciting when it gets started and it seems magical but after a while you have to realize you know what maybe the digital twins are the thing and iot is just the plumbing and so, you know, you, so digital twins was like modeling something. I'm going to have a, a digital model of a physical object. And so if I have a physical pickup truck with four tires and an engine and a fuel tank and all that kind of stuff, you know, in fact, I like to explain it. You know, if you're in a, a relatively new vehicle these days, your dashboard is showing you all kinds of sensor information, actually, uh, that maybe you've never seen before. And so... All you know, it might tell you the pressure in your right front tire and things like that. So a digital twin can create a digital model of like that vehicle in every last aspect of it. And then you from there you can kind of you can put you know, you can do rules, you can put uh, yeah, key performance indicators, KPIs. So I'll give you a simple example. My digital twin of my pickup truck maybe says, My tires, what do I care about them? I care about air pressure, PSI and my unit of measure is PSI. Um, and then it's an integer. It's a whole number. That's the value. And I can create KPIs. Hey, the green zone is, I want to be right around between 31 and 33 PSI. And then yellow is I'm getting farther away from that. And red, you know, I'm getting to a flat tire or maybe exploding tire. So you can put all that stuff on the digital twin of the car, the vehicle, and then the real live vehicle and that's the difference. You, you know, we've been able to make models and you see 3D models. We've designed aircraft and all kinds of machines using these 3D CAD things. The difference is it's alive. And so now your your actual pickup truck driving down the road is sending live telemetry about all of the aspects of its health over IoT. And it's filling up that digital twin, the digital version of it. And then there's kind of an event happening and it's like, Okay, we'll just stick with the tires, for instance. You know, all right, I'm getting real-time data telling me the pressure of all your tires. And then as as it's coming in, I, I you know, your software on your IoT platform with your digital twin 
It's looking at the incoming data, saying this is the real world, this is what's going on with your pickup truck. And then my twin, my truck and the KPIs I've defined says, hey, this is what's good. And maybe this is what's bad or getting bad, you know, or if I make it more agricultural like, you know, I'm monitoring soil moisture, let's just say, uh, in a block and a, on a farm uh, of apples, orchard, let's say. And my soil moisture and temperature and humidity uh, is telling me, hey, you know, we're getting into that yellow zone warning. You know, we're getting a little dry and based on, and, and then you brought algorithms. You know, you basically, you say, well, this, this type of soil and this kind of crop needs to have soil moisture at whatever percentage, you know, above 80%, but below 90, whatever, because you don't want too much water. And so how you bring the digital twins and IoT all together is those crops, that plumbing, and then automation is the last part. How do I, what's the action I'm going to take? Because if I don't, if I don't take an action on insights, then what was the point of the whole thing, right? And so you can imagine if it's a, depending on the sophistication of the farm, I may automatically in, in turn on an irrigation system to start watering that block. But then I'm keeping track because, you know, precision agriculture is key because we kind of have a drought or we kind of don't have as much fertilizer as we used to and things like that. And so as soon as you've got applied just the right amount of water um, and you see and you're getting because you're getting real time data, even while you're watering, irrigating, it'll go back down to the yellow the green zone and you can shut it off. And so that automation is that last part, taking actions on insights. So that's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell. Okay. Um, obviously, we want to continue talking about this regarding the farm. I mean, sensors have been around for a very long time, satellite imagery. We've had all that stuff. So yeah. how is, is this IoT part of it or the, the digital twin connection different than just having the sensors themselves? Well, that's a good question because you're right. It can be slightly. Before, we were all about digital twins. Digital twins was something that really kind of came from NASA and manufacturing. And, and even that was very nascent until I'd say the last few years, to be honest with you. Um, and so and so you're making a good point. Have we been able to do accomplish these same goals without digital twins? Yeah, kind of. Um, you know what I'd say the biggest change is now is economics, to be honest with you. There have always been advanced analytics technologies. And you're right, we've had sensors forever and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of times these technologies were just super expensive. Um, you know, I think about just being in this internet of things space in general and, and advanced analytics, governments could afford it. Large corporations could afford that kind of stuff. Uh, the military could afford it, but the average person, the average company, the average farmer, it was out of their reach. And so what I would say is we've had a perfect storm of not only did that smartphone revolution push down the cost and increase the pervasiveness of all these kinds of sensors uh, and giving us that network and now analytics that you want to run to, to, to drive insights. Instead of having to pay tens of millions of dollars to get something like that, I can just go to apache.org and download the stuff for free. I still have to know how to use it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I know people overuse the term. They say it's the democratization of whatever. But I really think that's what it is. It's now in the hands of everyone. Um, I think I think that's the biggest difference, to be honest with you. It's pervasive and economic. Um, um, yeah, I think um, most farmers will tell you, and, and we'll get into sustainability in a little bit here. Yeah. Um, you know, they all agree with the idea. I mean, I, I think growers are always called the, the original green, yeah. uh, you know, green green support team. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say, hey, this is a great idea, but if it's gonna, not gonna make me money, you know, right. um, they're not going to adopt it, you know, whether it's right. a new um, crop input or, or whatever it is. So are we at a point where these tools are are low cost enough? Have they been democratized enough, to use your term, um, that that uh, that just about any farm can use them? I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think we're quite there yet. OK, um, I think we were we've moved in a big direction that way. Uh, the only reason I say that is just personal experience. Uh, you know, deploy lots of, done lots of proofs of concepts on farms, large farms, things like that. Very positive outcomes. The grower is excited about it. But at scale, yeah, sometimes it can seem to be too expensive. 
And what I mean by it is despite this perfect storm of economic benefit of it going down at scale, like if I'm, let's say I just do a 10 acre block and we do a proof of concept and everything looks great. It's like, yeah, we want to go live. What's it going to cost to go to 10,000 acres? All of a sudden it's like, and let's just say I'm going to have one device per acre, you know? If that device though is a couple hundred dollars or three hundred dollars or whatever it happens to be, it's a it's a device with compute, storage, networking, a battery. You might have that solar above the canopy, um, and it has associated sensors connected to it uh, for temperature, humidity, all that kind of stuff, and soil moisture. And then everybody's got their hand up, right? Everybody wants to get paid. So there's the hardware maker makes that stuff. There's the connectivity. Uh, you know, if it's cellular, I'm probably paying for some data plan. Obviously, I've seen a lot of growers go into Laura, Laura land, because they can kind of roll their own uh, more cost effectively. And then there's the one of the platform that's capturing that data and doing analytics on it. And so I would, you know, depending on the farm, mega, mega scale farms, with a lot of funding can do it. Mom and pops still can't do it. But even larger farms I've worked with, still, it feels like a blood force trauma when you do the quick math on the back of the napkin, and you, they're like, it's going to cost me how much to get gone with this and how much per month. That's when you actually started from talking about clever business models. I think, um, I'd love to use the example of ADT security because it's something that's been around forever and everybody kind of understands it. And it's actually a classic IOT use case, even though we didn't know it when they started. Um, you know, I need security for my house and the deal is it's like, all right, I'm going to pay ADT or name your security company. And they're going to charge me whatever it is a month, thirty nine ninety five a month or whatever it is. And they're going to monitor. And if someone breaks in, they're going to call the cops. Um, but part of that deal is, hey, you're either going to pay whatever, 1500 bucks up front. We're going to put sensors on your doors and windows, um, you know, and then you're going to do your plan. Or if you can't afford that, we will roll that cost into your monthly plan. Right. Um, and so, but then, so it will cost more. But then maybe, it, you know, and so that you always hear about CapEx versus OpEx, right? But then you've got to be on some kind of minimum required, you know, 36 months or whatever to make sure they recoup the money. I think it'll be something like that to roll the cost of the hardware and connectivity into maybe a monthly subscription to try to beat that price down so that it's economically feasible uh, for the growth. Okay. So there are lots of sensors out there, lots of different kinds of monitors and everything. Um, do they have to be completely integrated? Can I have a sensor, you know, a soil sensor from here and a moisture sensor from over there and, you know, whatever else, what other devices are needed and, and sort of incorporate them into a, a single system? And where does the, um, you know, what ties it all together, I guess? That's a great point. Players in the IoT space outside of farming or whatever, you're right. You've seen a bunch of them where they build the whole solution end to end. You buy their sensor, their device, their platform, their everything. And and it's kind of like their way or the highway uh, as far as the solution. Then there's this other notion of, so when we talk about things like an IoT platform or digital twin, whatever, in software terms, I think of it as it's middleware is what it really is. And so if you build it in such a way, because I built this kind of technology myself, this greenhouse technology I've been building, it because I, the, the realization that you have to be flexible and be able to work with lots of different devices is critical. And so the key thing is, is you're using these protocols over the web or whatever that can work with anything. Because uh, you're right, I, I think it's important to not block out any kind of device or say, we only work with this. It's important to say, we can find a way to work with anything. It's not just me saying that. We had, uh, as you well know, the last several years, all of a sudden we all woke up to this supply chain problem that came out of nowhere. And, um, cause there were people, and, and I, I'd done proofs of concepts on farms with one particular kind of device that I was in love with and it was great. But then the supply chain problem, because all these components are coming from all over the world, all of a sudden you couldn't find them anymore. Or it was caught, take, you know, what, what was a two or three week lead time now was a 45 week lead time, which could be unacceptable. Or your ability to find it at a certain cost, you know, what was $100, now they wanted $300 for it. People are literally going on eBay and anywhere they can 
to find these devices. So people are scrambling. So it's super critical that the platform that you're using, that middleware platform that's either running up in a cloud somewhere or kind of you hear about edge computing at the edge, maybe it's at the farmhouse, the packing house somewhere nearby on the farm. It's critical that it can work with anything that uses open standards, open protocols, so that you can work with whatever device. Because yeah, when, when things got tough, you had to use whatever you could get. And so you're using a variety of sensors, like the same type, but from different brands and things like that to get what you need. So it's kind of a critical element for sure. Um, let's go back to digital twins for a second. You said yeah. maybe the mega farms are, 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 are using them. How far away are we from it being, I don't want to say run of the mill, but, but practical for, you know, medium, you know, large and medium, and even maybe at some point, small, small older farms. Yeah. I, that's probably five years. I would think, um, I don't even know that many mega farms are using digital twins. I think some of the mega farms are doing some kind of IOT and sensing at large scale. Uh, we've already seen the whole, like the drone thing, right? You know, doing spectral analysis. And I've seen lots of brewers say, wow, that's great stuff. How much does it cost? Oh, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, and so there's, there's that too. Um, you know, you know, it's interesting when you talk about cost though, all these problems in the world that growers face, you know, the number one problem I always hear when I ask all of them, it's still labor. And so another way maybe to grow this space is think about what's the fully loaded cost of one employee out on the farm doing all the tasks that they do. What, what do I pay them? You know, insurance, all that kind of stuff, you know, because aside from, you know, either have people going out and discovering these things or you, you know, looking for the beginning of fire blight coming into my orchard or something like that. Yeah, you know, people drive around ATVs all the time. It's probably important to think of those costs. You know, when you when you get afraid of these big IoT digital twin costs, um, as soon as you start comparing it to the fully loaded costs of people, it doesn't. It's not so scary. And I'm not trying to position this as, hey, we're going to get rid of jobs. The problem is we don't have enough people to do the jobs already, and so we have to think of this technology to, as augmenting operations because we just don't have enough people to help us. And so, uh, and so, yeah. And so I think for large scale farms, you know, digital twins is a little newer, I'd say another two ish years for big large scale, but yeah, five to six probably for smaller medium type farms. Okay. Um, you know, certainly, you know, you mentioned precision agriculture earlier. Um, you know, obviously very, I think what variable rate, uh, um, you know, tracking things were, were some of the first tools that were used and now they're pretty much everywhere. Yeah. At some point, hopefully this will become fairly standard. Right. Um, what will it look like to, will a digital twin look like to, you know, Joe Farmer um, when he goes, you know, gets up in the morning and I don't, turns on a computer, is that what he's going to do? And, and what's he going to see? What's it going to look like? How is his farm going to operate? You know what? You could probably get different answers depending on what IoT digital twin guy you talk to. And and I feel like I probably, the answers I would have given you maybe two years ago are probably different than now. And I'll tell you why. There's been this notion of, yeah, like the growers can open up their laptop and in the morning and they're going to see dashboards that the farm's talking to them and it's telling them what to do, where to go, where to put apply fertilizer, where to do water, all of those things. Um, and so that's one view of it. I have to say, I'm not on board with that anymore. I'm on board with IOT and this technology being invisible and being almost autonomous. And so what I mean by that, I'm not saying I want to take the power out of the hands of the grower, but a lot of these decisions are not rocket science decisions where you need some kind of crazy neural network AI thing to figure it out. And so. Just like in a factory, you you do things by exception. You know, I've got a million things going on. I don't have time to look at a million things. I'm not Homer Simpson looking at the screen in my nuclear reactor to see what's going on, right? Right. I, I want the system, because I have a lot of people go, Rob, we paid a lot of money for this technology. I don't want it to tell me what to do. I want it to do it. And, and that's a critical different element. And so I think for a grower, I think in the near future, I think that's what they're going to want to expect. 
I think it's like, hey, just let me know if there's something burning that I really need to do. But what I really want is this technology to automate it and do it all itself. And so whether it's a simple example of turning on and turning off irrigation to have that precise amount of water uh, applied uh, or sending a notification to a worker in the field to go turn on a valve and then turn it off, that kind of thing. Um, I think the growers don't want to just be staring at a screen all day. And so it could be as simple as text messages or things like that, you know? Um, and so that's kind of where my head's at, you know, again, there'll be people with a different point of view, but I think as we move in the future, I'm thinking of a, a smarter, more autonomous system that's actually doing the work. People, that's what they want. You know, we already have a labor shortage. I'm paying good money for this technology. Do the thing for me. Okay. Um, one of the other things that sort of listed on your uh, LinkedIn um, resume, so to speak, is uh, sustainability. You're, you're a big comp- proponent of sustainability. How does how does the Internet of Things, the IoT, how does di- how do digital twins fit into the sustainability picture when it comes to agriculture? Absolutely. I probably have already gone over a I think about water and fertilizer and a bunch of things like that. Think about this. Um, Every time I have to go, if I think about things like the, let's use the word inspection. Every time I have to get in a pickup truck and drive somewhere to go inspect something, what's the state of these crops or whatever it is, you know, um, or go look at monitoring my grain silos and the, the levels of those kind of things. Just the simple things, just simple inspection. Every time you have to go to that, you're, it's a person, it's a truck that you paid for, it's, it's fuel, it's every time you're using energy, there's emissions, right? Um, you know, there's this whole notion of getting to net zero emissions, right? CO2, methane, things like that. Um, folks in all kinds of industries look at that. Obviously, the oil and gas industry is really look, have looked at that in a big way now. Um, and so there's all kinds of emissions they come from, you know, there's that kind of sustainability, there's sustainability of labor, of people, of keeping your equipment lasting longer. And so a fully automated farm where it's just irrigating as needed, it's fertilizing as needed, it's using just the right or not as much herbicide and things like that is sustainable. Lots of people forget that the other part of the equation in farming is that packing house, the processing that goes on which looks just like process manufacturing. You know, there's so much more talk in IoT around this industry 4.0 thing. And so everybody's talking about smart factories, but what they forget is, is we have those same things out on the farms as well. Um, or they may be, it might be a co-op kind of thing where people are doing, you know, you see conveyor belts with apples or dryers and things like that. Lots of technology out there, a lot of things that are machines that have to have up time, a lot of them use a lot of fossil fuels and things like that. So monitoring that part of the farm is critical, just like monitoring every kind of machine that's on the farm and the needs of the farm itself. You know, you want to reduce the amount of times you're having to visit a location, do it automatically. You know, I want to reduce the amount of energy I'm using. If I don't have to keep driving places to check on things on the farm, I'm saving energy. I'm reducing my fuel and people and things like that. Uh, We talk about what happens after harvest in the supply chain. You know, going through the distributors, uh, cold storage, cold chains, you know, we do a great job on the farm and everything. And then we find out we've lost 30% of the food in the supply chain afterwards. And that's heartbreaking. I think IoT and digital twins have to play that role all the way. Because the whole thing is the supply chain, right? From seeds to planting, all the way until it arrives at the grocery store. Uh, Digital twins of the thing, the crops, follow and track all the way from where, what block they are on, on a farm, so where they are on the shelf at a grocery store or at a restaurant, you know, things like that. And so uh, we get to use all that technology all throughout to have a sustainable supply chain, to reduce loss and only reduce waste uh, in every kind of way, loss of food, waste of food, energy, emissions, uh, things like that. Yeah, it certainly seems that consumers are much more savvy and concerned about where their food is coming from so um you know having the ability to track all that stuff and let them even know what kind of crop inputs were put on and when and all that kind of stuff um seems rather important the digital twin of the crop in the ground and it follows it it runs 
it follows from harvest to processing to packing to storage to 18 wheeler to this distributor getting handed off and you're tracking and you also remember i talked about having those K kpis the key performance indicators on the twin you should have kpis on that twin that are appropriate for when it's in the ground to when it's going through packing to when it's traveling on a truck and everything that says hey this type of crop this type of food needs these temperatures or this kind of humidity or these kind of conditions and so that travels with it all the way to the end are we doing that today really <laughs> can we though i think we can you know some people are doing a better job than others i think doing it with this way i describe in digital twins though this might be a more standardized, easier way to do it. But I, I think lots of people try to do the best they can by hook or by crook, you know, uh, and everybody's probably doing it differently. Uh, but, I, but I think the digital twin way is a great, great way to follow that thing all the way through the supply chain. Okay. Um, you know, our readers, our listeners, uh, uh, you know, we focus, Agribusiness Global focuses primarily on crop inputs. Um, can you talk just, I mean, you, you know, you've talked, in general about the big picture. Can you focus a little bit on how, how digital twins, how IoT might affect the use of crop inputs specifically? Well, I guess we're trying to reduce inputs, right, as needed. You know, sure. there's some things you can't get away from. Um, if you're monitoring the soil, where do I need this input and where do I not need that input, right? Um, you know, and I don't want to be labor things like fertilizer. Everybody's, you know, probably over discussed since we've had this war in Ukraine, you know, we've had a, a lack of fertilizer. A lot of people don't understand why that is, or they don't know anything about the Haber-Bosch process. That's the only reason we have the population on the planet that we do today is because we know how to make artificial, you know, ammonia and all those kind of things to create artificial energy to create fertilizer. Well, all these things kind of play a role uh, in all that. That's a, that's a critical input, you know, because um, so often I've kind of, I know the average person doesn't look at this way. When I think about sustainability, you know, we talk, but for those of us in this space, we talk about how much more we're going to have to produce between now and 2050, you know, with the increasing global population. And that seems like the tallest order of all mankind, you know. It doesn't get all the headlines. Climate change gets all the headlines. But just beneath it is this whole food thing, right, and growing. And we've got to, you know, depending on who you talk to, it's 50, 70% more food. You know, I've heard growers say, we're gonna have to grow more than we've been growing since the beginning of farming, uh, which sounds insane. And so, so much of that is, well, we got to create more, but unfortunately we've got these headwinds, right? We have to do more with less. Depending on where you are, there's less water, there's less fertilizer, you know, or the cost of energy, your, your, like natural gas for your dryers when you're drying food when it's coming through processing, all those kind of things, uh, you know, plays a big role. And so I think about that in the big picture. I think about if that's not tough enough, we got half the country on fire every summer. We've got drought everywhere. We've got this whole desertification thing that I never heard of until a few years ago going on. And so uh, in some ways, it's the challenge of our time. Um, and so, to your point, and I know I'm not doing a great job of answering your question about inputs, um, but if I have fewer inputs and I need to create more than I've ever created before, it does feel like an all-hands-on-deck kind of scenario, to me at least. And so, is digital twins and IoT the whole solution? No, but it sure is part of it. It sure is part of it. There's a lot of other components that go into to address this challenge for sure. Oh. For sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, you're you're the expert in this area. I think I've covered my questions. What have I not talked about or not asked you about when it comes to these uh, these topics? I'm just curious about you know. I want all this to succeed. I want to help all these growers, and I, but I don't want it to be well. These guys get taken care of, but these folks who don't have enough money don't get taken care of because everybody needs to get fixed uh, in this way because it's a, it affects all of us. Um, and I don't know what kinds of things you see, or, you know, I don't know if it's more of a USDA thing or a governmental thing, um, cause I'm not as plugged in, you know, um, but I don't know what kind of things you see on where the money is, who are the big funders, are there big, you know, agribusiness things or, um, 
you know, so often when I hear about getting the big chunks of money you need to make something happen, instead of it being something that I'm used to in the tech world, like, oh, some VCs in Silicon Valley are going to do it. In agriculture, it's like, well, no, I need a grant from the USDA to make this happen. And it feels unfair, or, right. you know. And, you know, I don't know if you see anything different than I do. No, not at this point. Um, I, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, how is how is it going to play out? You know, you're, yeah. especially right now with the cost, um, it's, yeah. you know, farmers aren't going to pull it out of their pocket. And that's right. Retailers aren't going to, aren't going to, you know, I mean, again, because it has to be on the farm itself, right? It's not like, yeah. you know, a retailer can have a drone and maybe use that on several different farms. Or once you start talking about sensors, you can't just pick up the sensor, move it to the next farm, do some work, you know, and it's just not right. going to work that way. So, uh, right. so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, you know, it, where we are in five years. I think that was your, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. kind of time frame. Yeah. You know, or is it private equity folks? You know, obviously sure. we all talk about private equity scooping up farms yeah. and stuff like that. And that's an interesting thing because there's always that there's negative or positive connotations that go with private equity, somebody in New York City buying up all these farms around the country. Right. So depending on who I talk to, they're like, oh gosh. But other times I'll talk to those private equity folks and guess what? They're like, I don't know how to run a farm. I want to run it. I want the data to tell me what to do. Or I want to just have a dashboard from my office. I know that you know, like because you know what people look at? They look at they look at Elon Musk and they look at the gigafactory the lights out gigafactory where you look inside there and there's almost nobody there. It's fully automated. And I know people are like, well, how do I get that for my farm? And I know that seems like crazy talk. Um, and it is crazy talk, but there's a, there's some kind of delta between getting there and whatever. Can we move to it? Maybe it is, it, yeah, it's big. It's certainly going to be bigger, many sources. Um, I just worry that government will wait till it's too late or till the building's on fire, you know, to, to take those kind of actions. Sure. Um, so, I mean, well, I know we're just kind of scratching the surface here, but if somebody wants to look uh, and you listen to this and says, you know, that's interesting. Where can I find out more about it? Where, what would you suggest they do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to do my part building some technology to mostly give away, to be honest with you. You know, when I'm building this greenhouse technology, uh, it's IoT and digital twins. It's not like I'm just some other big company trying to make a bunch of money off the farmers because I get it. <laughs> and so, you know, just as important as, as the the use cases, you know, writing a book that goes along with it that says for all these different scenarios, use these sensors, this device, this wireless, this algorithm, whatever, to get the outcome. Because you know what? I, I know a lot of people need hand-holding uh, or they don't know where to start or what to do everything so, so you know i'm always happy to talk to anybody about this because you know can a lot of this be accomplished with lots of different technology from other vendors absolutely it can it absolutely can and so uh you know in my mind we just need to lift all boats and so certainly yeah folks can come come find me or robtiffany.com is my website um you know just by hook or by crook <laughs> and where can they find you on twitter yeah just at rob tiffany and, yeah, uh, obviously LinkedIn, they just look up your name and they'll find yeah, you. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Rob. Thanks again for being with us today, Rob. We enjoyed your insights and we learned a lot. At least I know I did. Join us next time when we talk with Kylie Hall from Hector. Learn about the company's orchard management software and how it's used to help growers manage their operations.